portfolios are so underweight as to be ridiculous. I mean, they've almost got no gold at all. And, you know, and, and things that represent gold like ETFs. And I think the total tonnage of ETFs is still uh, sort of two and a half thousand tons, something like that. I mean, that in the grand scheme of things, when you're talking about portfolio uh, investment um, totaling worldwide about 150 trillion dollars equivalent, um, you know, a couple of thousand tons of gold in ETFs is absolutely nothing. In a recent video, Alastair McLeod, a seasoned financial expert, shared his insights on what he believes will unfold as the year of great wealth adjustment in 2024. McLeod predicts two major shifts, a substantial bear market in traditional investments such as bonds and equities, and a decline in the value of credit, emphasizing the importance of understanding the distinction between real money, represented by gold and credit, encompassing currencies and bank deposits. The cloud foresees a significant bear market emerging in ordinary investments, particularly bonds, with equities reaching a perilous state due to their disconnect from bond yields. Simultaneously, the dynamics driving the value of credit down, including currencies and bank deposits, are becoming increasingly apparent. McLeod stresses the urgency for people to grasp the disparity between real legal money, historically represented by gold and credit. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. I think that 2024 is going to be the year of great wealth adjustment. And this is going to come, I think, in two forms. I think, firstly, um, I expect a massive bear market to develop in ordinary um, investments such as bonds. We've already seen the start of that in bonds, but in equities, they have got so so out of line with bond yields as to be really in a very dangerous con condition. I think that's going to change in, um, in, in this 2024 year. Um, and the second thing is that uh, I, I can see the dynamics driving the value of credit down. Now, what do I mean by credit? By credit, I mean currencies, and obviously, uh, the bank deposits that you have at a bank and other forms of credit. Everything else is credit. It's becoming desperate for people to actually understand the difference between real legal money, which is gold, always has been gold ever since the Rome's five tables back in, sorry, 12 tables back in 550 BC. Um, the difference between gold and credit is important to understand money. And this is, I think, absolutely vital. People are going to latch onto this if, as I expect, the gold price, which actually is not the price of gold, it's the value of the dollar, it's the value of gold, price of, of the dollar. If that goes through, you know, goes through $2,000 and appears to be going higher, people are going to be scratching their heads and saying, what is going on here? What does this mean? Should I be involved in this? Now, from the portfolio point of view, I'd just like to make the point that um, less than 1% of global portfolios actually have gold in them. And gold, if you like, gold substitutes like mining shares and so on, and ETFs and so on. Um, now, that less than 1% is extraordinary. It is not ordinary, it is extraordinary. Normally, we would expect to see a far higher representation of gold in a portfolio. To put this into context, a 1% shift in that relationship would add 23,000 tonnes to global portfolios in physical gold. That's a 1% shift. And when you bear in mind that in our days, um, you know, going back to the 70s, uh, uh, Godfrey, we had um, typically you were looking at portfolios having been 10 and 15% exposed in gold. Now, those times, the 70s appear to me to be returning. So it, it is becoming desperately important for people to get in on this early, even if they don't understand credit. And this is why I've set up a new Substack. This Substack channel is aimed at informing people about what money is and what credit is, the difference, the characteristics, why you should be going out of credit and hedging into gold. It's like an insurance policy against things we can see already developing, which are really quite terrifying in prospect. And this includes things like um, domestic monetary policy, um, the geopolitical shift 
um, away from uh, the dollar towards um, something else yet to be defined. But a lower dollar, lower demand for dollar, lower ownership of dollar has enormous consequences for the whole of the fiat currency uh, complex. It's explaining these things that my substack is devoted to doing. And um, I would um, I, I would really encourage people to join, um, to subscribe to my substack. I mean, preferably as paying visitors for the very simple reason that if you um, are a member of something which costs absolutely nothing, you don't actually absorb the information properly. But if you do pay something, then you will read it. And that is what I want to achieve. I want to spread the education about what money is and what credit is. Understanding that circulating medium which we live with every day and depend upon. Anyway, that's really the um, you know the major development that uh, I, I really want to work on for 2024. The portfolios are so underweight as to be ridiculous. I mean, they've almost got no gold at all, and you know, and and things that represent gold like ETFs. And I think the total tonnage of ETFs is still uh, sort of two and a half thousand tons, something like that. I mean, that in the grand scheme of things, when you're talking about portfolio uh, investment um, totaling worldwide about $150 trillion equivalent, um, you know, a couple of thousand tons of gold in ETFs is absolutely nothing. That is an anomaly. I think, Godfrey, the reason it's come about is because of regulation. Uh, bear in mind that the compliance officers are only um, will only support, um, if you like, an investment case that a, um, that a manager puts forward in the sense of regulated investments. Now, gold is not a regulated investment. So when you start talking about gold, the poor compliance officer, his eyes just glazed over. Um, and, you know, he says, computer says no. This is, and I think, I think it's this regulation tendency uh, and as well as that, I mean, if you think about um, the position of a fund manager, he's now sort of corralled into uh, providing a mutual fund which has uh, three levels of risk. You know, there's there's low risk, there's medium risk, and there's high risk. He's actually steered into the sort of investments that fit into those categories. And of course, gold, if you like, is the anti-credit. It just doesn't fit in with it at all. So I think it's I think it's it's regulation more than anything else that has driven um, gold out of uh, fashion. Let's put it, call it fashion, um, because investment is a fashion. And that's what we've got at the moment. I mean, we've got a fashion which is very, very heavily weighted towards, um, you know, technology stocks, high technology stocks, artificial intelligence. These are the things that spark the imagination of an investment manager, not a true assessment of the risk. Highlighting the anomaly that less than 1% of global portfolios incorporate gold, McLeod underscores the importance of recognizing gold as a pivotal asset. Comparing the current situation to the 1970s, where portfolios commonly held 10-15% in gold, McLeod argues that a 1% shift in the gold representation could add 23,000 tons to global portfolios. In response to this, McLeod has launched a new Substack channel aimed at educating people about the fundamental differences between money and credit encouraging them to consider gold as an insurance policy against unfolding economic uncertainties. McLeod delves into the reasons behind the meager gold exposure in portfolios, attributing it to regulatory constraints and the influence of compliance officers. The regulatory focus on categorized risk levels and the fashion-driven nature of investment trends, particularly favoring technology stocks, has marginalized gold as it does not fit neatly into these regulated categories. Despite being a reliable form of money and a historical store of value, gold has fallen out of fashion due to regulatory hurdles and prevailing investment trends. If you actually, if as an investment manager, you actually understood risk, you would probably throw in the towel because it is, the whole situation is just getting so, so difficult. And I think that's why there is so little exposure really to the anti-credit, which is really what gold is. Gold is not an investment. In fact, it is cash. It is money. It is money of last resort. It's the money you hoard. You don't circulate your sovereigns or your gold eagles <laughs> in exchange for goods and services. Basically, you hang on to it until you've exhausted all your credits, the credit being bank deposits. 
being um, your credit card, being um, your investments in, 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 in bonds and shares and things like that. All that is credit. The whole world is credit, both circulating and non-circulating. When it comes to real money, that is the physical gold. And it is so out of fashion, Godfrey. And not only that, but the, the, the regulations, the, um, the propaganda, the whole thing is just anti anti-gold and that's got us to this situation which is just so extreme but you and i know from our experience in markets that markets um can be very broken but eventually markets actually reassert themselves over anything that governments particularly would like to see and it's only a matter of time before that happens of course the length of that time is something that we can only guess at but I can, I can tell you with absolute confidence that at some stage, markets real, will reassert themselves and the true value of credit will be exposed for what it is worth. And against that event, I think anyone who doesn't have possession of real money, some real money, will find themselves very substantially disadvantaged. McLeod explores the role of exchange-traded funds edifs in the gold market, emphasizing that while they are meant to be fully physically backed by gold, they represent possession of credit rather than money. He highlights the potential pitfalls of edifs, including the ability to be shorted in the market, raising concerns about compromised ownership of real money. McLeod contrasts this with the historical role of gold as a form of money and a hedge against credit collapse. Drawing parallels with historical financial bubbles, McLeod expresses skepticism about the longevity of the cryptocurrency phenomenon, particularly focusing on Bitcoin. He argues that the widespread belief in Bitcoin's perpetual increase is based on a simplistic notion related to central banks continuously printing money. McLeod suggests that the rise of cryptocurrencies may be akin to a bubble, questioning their long-term viability in the face of market dynamics. The first, the first is, what is an ETF? Quite simply, it is a security uh, with an underlying objective. And that underlying objective is defined in the prospectus. Now, with a gold ETF um, meant to be fully physically backed by gold, um, then uh, really what you're getting is not possession of money, which we've just defined, but you're getting possession of credit, which represents money. It is not the same thing. Uh, a security is not money. The security is an investment. It is not money. So that, I think that's that's the, the, the first point I'd like to make. Uh, the second point really is that um, we cannot be sure that um, even though there is a trustee, um, there is a custodian um, and all the rest of it, when you look at the, uh, the structure of ETFs, um, you get uh, a situation where uh, this can be shorted in the market. Now, when it's shorted in the market, this basically, Imagine that you're what's called an authorized particip participant. This is this is a major bank which can deal in, say, um, half a million shares of GLD or something like that. So what he does, what the bank does is it goes, it shorts GLD into the market. It borrows the stock off a pension fund. It submits that stock to uh, the trustee and or the custodian. And uh, that stock is then in cash in return for gold. So gold bullion comes out, but you've now got two owner owners in effect of the same security. So that you can see that as an insurance policy against the collapse of credit, an ETF is a very compromised way of having that insurance policy in terms of ownership of real money. From two points of view, first of all, the skullduggery that occurs, if you like, in the actual um, uh, management of the situation and how that is uh, used by the system. And the second point is that it is not actually physical possession of money. Now, with respect to Bitcoin, this is um, there is a further problem on this one. And that is, I, I would suspect that if Charles Mackay was writing his um, uh, you know, his book on bubbles today, as opposed to over 150 years ago, or whenever it was, um, I suspect there would be a chapter on cryptocurrencies. This is a phenomenon of a bubble. It's no more than that. Now, the reason I say that is that everybody who owns Bitcoin or who deals in it believes that it's going up. 
um, they believe on the basis of a very, very simple argument, and it's in fact a simplistic argument, that because central banks print money like, um, you know, there's no tomorrow and are increasing the rate of their printing. Mm -hmm.